scanning for audio. Welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast. It feels like forever since I've been, well, able to record. Yes, I know you've had them throughout the whole summer. But let's face it, I usually bank up a few episodes and then go for it. I've got my recorder strapped up in the car, well, blue tacked. And I'm able to talk to you while I drive to Hooverville. Hooverville 7 for me, Hooverville 8 for everyone else. Yes, last year I was just a tiny bit ill and couldn't make it. This year, I didn't go to a new, well, take away and buy something that genuinely didn't agree with me. No, this year, I'm reasonably prepared. Yes, I didn't get to meet Matthew Waterhouse and a host of others, but that was last year. This year, this year it's going to be different. This year I'm going to meet Janet Fielding. Probably. Sophie Aldred. Probably. Eric Sayward. Probably. Katie. And so many others. And obviously I'll be recording the interviews and so will everyone else and I'm sure we'll be able to produce something marvellous towards the end. But right now, I'm on the M62, heading in completely the opposite direction to Derby. Thank you, Satnav. In order to get under the A1 South. I should be at Sheffield at some point. And barring, well, incidents, I'll be there. So as always, I'll keep you informed and keep you up to date with what's happening. But right now, I'm just excited. And on the car's MP3 player, I've got a serious collection of big finish to get through. So bring on Fiesta of the Damned for me. And for you, well, I'll get back to you very shortly. I don't know what that 
was like an extra money paid for. Um, uh, and so it became about, which was much more interesting to me to do, to write it in a different form. And actually the, the radio shows, it tells the same story, but it's got many different jokes um, and situations from the, the live show that didn't lend themselves to radio adaptation. And in fact, the bits I don't like in the radio show are bits that I insisted on keeping from the live show that actually seem pretty incongruous and 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 I would now um, I would now accept the fact that the producer has my best interests at heart and there's a reason he wants to drop stuff and I shouldn't dig my heels in. It's amazing, it's interesting. Um, but I thought, you know, I, I was young and, and had this idea that everybody was against me, so therefore why would he be one? Well, I don't know why I thought that. He wants to put my show on the radio. I was an idiot. I mean, that's one of the challenges of, of taking something that you've You've written once, it's been successful, and then adapting it for the different yeah. format. Yeah, um, once I knuckled down to it, it was okay. Once I came up with the idea of having the voice of the BBC, which wasn't in the one man show at all, so I'd have somebody to talk to, and it was the telly talking back to me. Once I came up with that idea, it sort of wrote itself because then I could have you weren't doing sort of rhetorical talking to yourself jokes, which which just makes them, which just makes the, 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 the rhythm a bit much easier. And it was a funny idea that back when you had this BBC voice and this annoying Doctor Who fan shouting at the telly. Uh, so once I came up with that idea, it, it, it that gave it its own lease of life. But um, it was only about five years later that I went back and actually told me when a producer says he likes your work and wants to put it on the radio, he's on your side. Mm. Um, so in fact, the last radio play that I wrote, I went in and just went, this producer likes you, she's got you the commission, listen to what she says and do it. And it was a much happier experience and I think a much better, a much better piece of work because these people are employed, these people are producers for a reason, there is a, you know, there is a, a, a reason for having them. Um, but yeah, so I did it as a, a, I did it as a radio play, I toured it, um, it got longer as it was in Edinburgh, it was 55 minutes long by necessity, but by the time I, the last time I did it was uh, at the Garrick Theatre in London, and it ran to an hour and three quarters. Um, so it's, it sort of grew. You write your best work on stage, you can do that as much as you like, but actually when you're in the moment is when you think of the best jokes. Uh, so it just gradually, without any um, orchestration on my part, it just sort of gradually grew. And because I was doing it, I was touring it, I was doing it three or four times a week, there's nothing better than that to get into a rhythm and, and, and just really nail it. Um, uh, I've also, and I've recorded it for DVD, and I've also written about 10,000 words of a book, but I think I did that. So, yeah, it could, it could, but never leaves me. But then part of it is, but I hung on to it for so long, it was only when I did the next one that I realised this, because I, I sort of thought, well, it's taken me my whole life to write this, I'm never going to do anything as good or successful again. Of course, then when you do the new thing, the new thing's new and it's exciting, and you go, of course I can, that's silly. And it also spawned a sequel. Yes, My Steps Unstole My Sonic Screwdriver, which um, which I actually think is a better show. Um, there's not a radio version of that, but I've recorded the live version for DVD again. Ed Stradlin's supposed to be editing it for me, but um, he's taking his time and he's buying more drinks. Because um, that's how it's done, you know, doing it on May 3, it's really. Uh, which I think was a better show, actually. Um, but it showed how the landscape has changed. When I toured Moths, I toured it for about three years and did every art centre in the country, pretty much. Uh, and I stepped up and got as good, if not better, reviews and did really well in Edinburgh in terms of numbers. But I didn't tour anything like as much because a lot of those art centres that I had played for Moths weren't there anymore. Uh, uh, or we're only doing sort of the, you know, when they, whereas they used to, you'd go there and you'd notice that the team from Test Match Special had been on the night before and Alan Cochran or Sarah Merkin were on the night after. You now go to places and they're only open, you know, Friday and Saturday because that's all the football that they get in. Mm -hmm. So live, live entertainment is, is, is struggling. So touring, unless your places want to take people who've been on eight out of 10 caps and those sorts of people, they, there's less of a sort of exclusively live circuit anymore. But that's so. at the beginning you, you mentioned about coming coming to uh, your place through stand up. Mm. What possessed you to take on stand up in the first place? It's a it's a terrifying profession. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, 
When I was at university, a friend of mine said, a friend, the sort of guy I knew, said, um, I'm going to do a stand-up night. Do you want to have a go? And I went, oh, yeah, all right. Thought no more of it. And then he showed me a flyer that had my name on it. Uh, so I went, oh, I'll do it instead. And I just sort of wrote three pages verbatim and, you know, and, and wrote it out, you know, with every pause and comma and learn and everything. I learnt it like an actor learns a script and went on and did it. And actually, one of the other comics, I got talking to this guy, and Doctor Who cropped up. Uh, how Doctor Who cropped up? I think I've just got Doctor Who to rest, you know. Hello, Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and he said, he said, oh, I was in, I was in Doctor Who, and I thought, and his, his name was on the fly, it's Vincent Kelly. I thought, well, I'm a credited rather than Doctor Who, because otherwise I'd, I'd know who you were. <laughs> Uh, and he said, oh, I was, I was in full circle. Oh, well, one of the other, the non-speaking actors in the cave, so there's, 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 there's a couple of them in the book, they get their own camera up, and they get pulled over the swamp. Uh, and he said, oh, no, I played Tynox. Well, he's got a little pattern. Do you know that? Uh, but he totally changed. He's quite short for Dunkin' now, but he's sort of quite short for Dunkin' now, but he's sort of quite short so he was a Doctor Who actor at my first ever stand up. So it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a portent. And um, when I did this gig, and it went, oh, yeah, I invited those of friends who were, of course, laughed at everything I said. Uh, and I, and it felt, it felt unlike any acting play. I still prefer acting, it's easy. Um, uh, and you're not on your own. Um, and actors are largely nicer than comics. Um, uh, and, uh, and because it went well, I then got a bit of a taste for it, so then I sort of walked around a few open mic places, and um, people started to give me money. And I think because I didn't have any ambition to do it, but I quite enjoyed doing it, I sort of got, got good without it necessarily without necessarily feeling the pressure, do you know what I mean? You see people now who are so young and hungry and ambitious for it. I was just sort of happy to muddle along doing it. So then I, I found myself earning a little by mistake, uh, which is quite a nice position to be in. Do, do you still have the same preparation style? Do you still write everything out, word by word? Or I, have to, I haven't written a joke in years now. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I compare a lot of the same places. A regular gig on Tuesday, a regular gig on Wednesday, and a regular gig every other Sunday. And there's quite a regular crowd at some of those. So I, I now just go on and um, I've obviously got a storehouse of stuff that I've done. Uh, but my, what I tell myself, if it's any good, I'll, I'll remember it. But that is really a lazy man way of going, I can't be asked to write anything down. So therefore, I'll do this mental pirouette to justify my influence. Uh, because I'm emceeing, I go away, I can talk to the audience and make things happen. So I, no, I haven't sat there. I mean, if, if, if ever, it's not going to happen, but if anyone was foolish enough to go, um, I need to um, investigate the Toby Halo archives, be loads of missing episodes, because I haven't written anything down, I haven't recorded anything. <laughs> uh, so, you know, um, and all the stuff that we, we can't see in here is obviously the best stuff. Uh, uh, perhaps I should bring Phil Morris and say, have you got any of my jokes? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the bits, somebody came up to me the other day and said, love that joke you do about that. And I went, oh yeah, when did I, I'd forgotten that joke. And I, you know, and I would have done it every night for, you know, three years or something, but slowly you get bored of it or it just, for some reason, they have all, all the material has a shelf life, and I think partly because when something new or you're forming it, you, you perform it better because you're more excited. And stuff just sort of drops by the wayside. And you, uh, I've probably forgot some crackers, which, which of course, when you're struggling, you sometimes you sort of think, I wish I'd got all that stuff up here. So it's, uh, you know, if I'm struggling, I've got to ask you, you must have had the nightmare gigs, the, the ones you'd rather forget. Anyone that says otherwise is a liar. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, a friend of mine put it very well. Um, when somebody asked him, comic book Seymour Mace and Margaret, they said, you know, you have gigs where everyone takes a junior. He said, yeah, he said, but you know, 
I just look at them and get if somebody says you know, you're, you're not very good or it goes, I'm just having a bad day at work. Mm. Just, everyone has a bad day at work. And that's a very good way. It doesn't feel like that. Um, um, and yeah, sometimes it's your fault, sometimes it's their fault. Uh, it happens less frequently. I mean, it, um, it, it, uh, you get to a certain point where, you know, unless it's a, a gig that just ain't gonna, ain't gonna happen because it's full of, you know, sometimes it, uh, the thing is to not be intimidated. At Christmas, for example, you're never gonna have a great gig in December because no, because you'll go to the best comedy clubs in the country and there'll be 40 people there, one of whom's organised the Christmas party. He likes comedy. The other 39 just want to get pissed on the bosses, go out and the monkeys that they're at stand-up comedy. I want to get off with Michelle from accounts or want to tell John what they think of him because he's been a crap all year. And, and you are remarkably irrelevant to this and there's nothing you can do. So then you just have to go, well, look, I know I can do this. It's their problem and I'll just make the best of it. And tits and teeth for an hour and a half and, 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 and then I'll get paid a bit more than I would have got paid in October for doing a better gig and that's why I don't get paid a bit because it's, it's horrible. In, in general though, do you have to really get the audience as quickly as possible on your side or do you think you can, if it's not going as well, can you win them over? Um, you can win them over, it's more hostile audiences, some Hostile. I mean, it, it doesn't happen so much anymore because comedy clubs have cottoned on to the fact that they do. They may as well be a pub if they're not gonna if they're not gonna gear it towards the comedy. So most places have bouncers now, and people just say, you know, don't talk and all that sort of thing. <coughs> um, but you can You yeah. You, you. I notice it a lot because I work in the north a lot, and I sound and I look like this. I I I, I largely go up to people that you make an assumption that they're not going to find me funny because of the way I look and the way I talk. And so I know that I sometimes have, <coughs> I've got a couple of minutes in which I, good jokes I know normally get a really good response, might not get much, but I know that that's because they're sussing me out and I just have to have the confidence to go, it's okay, but I'll be fine in two minutes. That, 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 that good joke's only gonna get a titter. That's fine. And, 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 and that happens quite a lot. It used to happen in the Frog and Bucket in Preston. <laughs> always, I'd always, I'd always forget. I go on and go. Oh yeah, they never liked me at first, but it'll be fine. So long as I, once I pick on one of them, or, you know, have a go, or do a thing there, or say something back when they heckle me, they'll be fine. And I used to, but I'd always go. It always takes you two minutes to walk to me. You know? um, so it's just a case of not being, or if you if you ask, yeah, pretending you're not. It's all a lie. It's <laughs> confidence trip. I'm going to move on to more Doctor Who related questions later. There's one more thing I want to ask you about the stand up connection. Obviously, I'm looking at your, your CV and your website and everything this week. There's a project you're involved in, um, Dead Funny, Encore. Oh, horror yes. Horror stories. Horror stories. stories? This is horror stories written by stand up comedians. <laughs> I think it sounds brilliant, I've got to say. I'm really interested in getting it myself. Well, I'm very good for. I'm, I'm flattered by the company, I think. I'm, I'm good friends with a comedian called Robin Hitz. Robin Ince was one of the first comics I ever saw, and he was, and I thought I'd like him just by, just by the bio of his picture. And I went to see him, he was, he was great. And then one of the first ever paid gigs I got, I was on the bill with him and Will Smith, not the American one, the other one. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they were both really nice to me, they laughed at my jokes. And I felt like a proper comic, even though I was young. And didn't really think I was a proper comic. And, um, when he came to Manchester, he'd bring me up and we'd go out for a drink. And he was the first person that told me I would earn a living as a stand-up. And that was very flattering coming from him because I admired him so. So we stayed in chums. And uh, we keep in touch on and off, but he's phenomenally busy. He does far too much. He's going to have a heart attack before he's 50. Um, and, um, and he just sent me an email and said, um, I'm doing this, do you want to write a horror story? That's, that's the only brief, write whatever you want. Um, uh, for this anthology, 3,000 words. Um, and it was as simple as that. And I did a draft and I sent it in and they went, yeah, do you want me to change anything? I went, no. Oh. <laughs> I went, oh, okay. And then I saw the list of the other people, James A. Caston, brilliant comic, and Alan Moore, he's not comedian, I don't know, I like that, but I think he's got the start. <laughs> uh, and uh, Stuart Lee and Rufus Hound and all sorts. And um, <laughs> Uh, I've only just got my copy, so I haven't read any of the other people, but I almost don't want to read 
young people's because I didn't write, mine's not funny, mine is my, I just wrote a horror story. I tried to think of, you know, there's a Martha Ghost books that you got and, and yeah. those sorts of things. I, 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 I just tried to write something that had a bit of a twist uh, and was a bit of atmosphere to it. And I'd never done anything like it. Uh, and I thought, I, and I didn't think of it as I am a comedian writing a horror story. I just tried to write a horror story. And um, I quite enjoyed it, but with all of those things, then you went sort of back and set in stone. Do you think, I enjoyed that, and I think it's all right, but I, I wish I could spend a bit more time. You know, I wish I had taken it a bit more seriously at the time, because it's only when it materialises in front of you, you go, well, no, this is actually a thing. So it is horror something you would read yourself? Is something you read yourself? I read a lot, I did read a lot of horror as a, as a, well, a bit of horror as a kid. I'm not, terrible that I largely read Doctor Who books <laughs> and I largely read Doctor Who books now. Um, I mean I've read Fury from the Deep three times and I've never read Far From the Magic Crown. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, got, I've got an English degree. Uh, so I would read bits of I like the Amada Ghost books and I'd, I'd read the odd the odd horror thing um, but uh, once I realised that Doctor Who was my thing and now that I'm a grown up and I don't have to answer to anybody, I just sort of go, oh, if I want to buy a doctor on location, I'll buy a doctor on location, I'll read that, I don't care. So uh, <laughs> I, like, I don't read much fiction. I occasionally go when I go on holiday, but um, uh, yeah, I've read bits of books, but I'm not an expert. I've never read a Stephen King book. Um, I've watched the film. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've stayed on Doctor Who territory again. Um, can I ask you about your, well, one of your latest projects? You, you really, you're the go-to man for interviews, aren't you? Well, I'm, I'm best of my price range. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, for what, I'm the, for, what, in terms of um, podcasts, podcasts um, commentaries, uh, DVD extras? Yeah, well, the podcast is just... Well, I'll go, let's start with the DVDs, I okay. guess, because that... I... A chap called Peter Crocker, who is the guy that uh, <coughs> mends the pictures so that they look like they were made yesterday rather than 50 years ago. He came to see my set, my Doctor Two scarf in Buxton, and he sent me a message via a Doctor Who forum and said, uh, I like your show, I work on DVD, you're to go for a drink. And we went for a drink, we really get to go. And he, at that time, he wanted to do some comedy extras. And we batted around a few ideas, and I was relatively new to the internet then. And then I spent some time on the internet, and I thought, I don't want to do a comedy extra on the DVD, because frankly, being called a twat by Doctor Who fans is not something I particularly want to do. My way to do. Uh, and comedy and Doctor Who fandom is, is a bit like oil and water in, 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 in sometimes, as I find when I sometimes tweet a joke, and people go, I think I'll find. <laughs> um, uh, and. Uh, and I just thought, and I just, I just couldn't get enthused about doing a comedy extra on a DVD, even though I was terribly flattered to be asked. But during our conversations, you know, I would say to him things like, he'd go, oh, we've just done a commentary for the war games. I'd go, oh, did you get so-and-so? He'd go, oh, no, we couldn't find him. I'd go, oh, well, I could have found that. I don't know where he is. Um, and so then they started to occasionally sort of say, well, do you know where so-and-so is? So then Peter said, um, well, would you moderate commentary? I was like, I, I dream of what they, when I'm cycling to gigs. Some people do their Oscar speeches, and I would be going, and you're listening. I, I, would, I would pretend I, I, I did have sort of fantasised about my greatest coaches because I thought I was right up my street. I'm watching Doctor Who with the people who made Doctor mm. Who. Uh, and I went, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, so he, he suggested me to John Kelly because John was doing The Rescue and the Romans, and it was the um, and it was a combination of Ray Cusick, who was perhaps never the most effusive. <laughs> uh, William Russell, who's lovely but sort of knows what he wants to say, uh, and Christopher Burr. So it was, the average age of the commentary was going to be about 84. Um, and, um, and so he said, um, you know, would I, would I do that? And I, I, I said, yeah, sure. And I, and I did that, and it seemed to go quite well. well then, so John used me. John was the producer that used me. And then, then something happened with the Time Monster, where John Levine had recorded a couple of bits of commentary, and so somewhere in the big DVD spreadsheet, somebody had ticked commentary next to Time Monster. 
So then when they were putting the DVD together, they went, right, let's lay the commentary on. They went, we, we've got John Levine for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's all we've got. So I, I got a phone call from Steve Broster, who I'd never worked with before, who went, look, we're really stuck. We haven't got any money. So we can only, we're only doing this commentary with Barry Letts, Marion McDougall, and we've got Susan Penhalligan on one of the episodes. Um, we do, uh, um, and maybe we'll do a fan commentary on episode three. Um, like, so could you do us a favour? And I went, I'll do it for free, so long as I can do the Ambassadors of Death, because it, it's a favourite of mine, and I knew Steve was planning Ambassadors of Death. Uh, and so then I worked for Steve, and he liked what I did, so then he kept asking me that. And again, I'm terribly cheap. My own worst enemy, that's the problem. Um, people, I think people think I have a lot of money out of Doctor Who, I don't. So Andrew, Andrew tells Rob, he says, you've got to stop doing things for free. Uh, and uh, 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 and so, so they started using me, and, I, and I, then I would start to sort of suggest people, or as I say, you know, they go, do you know where so and so is? And I, I usually did, because I. Uh, not, not very exciting, and I'm not I'm working out where acting are. Um, so I found myself sort of, you know, ma making suggestions for who should be on which one and things like that. And then I, I just had this idea like, somebody sent me a list of um, DVDs that they were planning to pitch extras for and said, Did I have any ideas? And so for the sensor rights, I had this idea of the sensor rights was the open story where the writer and the director were both dead before Doctor Who fandom got its hands on people, sort of thing. Uh, and I thought, well, Mervyn Pitfield, nobody knows that much about Peter R. Newman, nobody knows anything about. Why don't we do a thing where we find out about both of them? Uh, and I sort of liked that idea, but then Chris Chapman, I worked with on a couple of things, or well, I helped him out. Uh, and he said he'd been asked to do the sense rights. So I said, well, I pitched this idea to another producer. Uh, and he said, oh, they're not taking stuff from freelancers anymore. They're, they're only using me and one of the guy. So I went to this freelancer and said, look, I don't think it's going to happen. But do you mind if I take the idea? He went, no, 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 fine. And, um, and Chris refined. Chris is very good. He refined it. And he just went, people sort of know bits about Mervyn Pinfield, because Verity Lambert's talked about him and things like that. Nobody knows a thing about Peter Onion. Let's just concentrate on the one guy. Uh, because he got, you know, Wikipedia had one death day, IMDb had another, but nobody knew anything about it. Uh, and then he said, but I've got to take it off you because if, if you want to do it, you can't know anything. So then I spent three months not knowing whether it was happening or whether it was not. And then a week before he said, look, we're going to have to call this off. We're just going to have to do a making of talking heads because we haven't found anything. And I sent, and I sent an email to Richard Bignall because I, well, I knew he'd been doing the research. I said, oh, shame that hasn't worked out, but thanks for trying, that would've been nice. And he went, just got one more thing I'm gonna try. And then three days later, Chris went, actually, we're back on, sorted. Uh, uh, watched the film yesterday, and we've got a good little, little bits of prep. And I sort of knew on one day we'd be going there, and, one day, and I knew we'd be speaking to people, so I knew something was, was happening. And, um, and I think I was really pleased with that, because I quite often watch Doctor Who DVD extras going, that's wrong. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and this was one where we genuinely found something out that people didn't know. You know, nobody yeah. knew anything about it. And we found out everything about it. We got a voice recording, we got a picture. And so we, you know, I always feel sorry. I, I, there's something, one of the, my favorite thing about being a Doctor Who fan is, is the less watching Doctor Who. Because um, again, I think most Doctor Who fans only live in retrospect. Um, and you spend your time watching an episode going, oh, I didn't like that particularly. And then five years later, you look back and go, I love that episode. <laughs> uh, I don't know why that is. Uh, and, uh, but it's the uncovering. It's fine. That's so why I love the work that Andrew Pixley and Richard Bingham and people do where they go, I found a thing or I've written a thing. And it's brilliant. I love the archaeology of it. So to, to actually take part in a piece of archaeology and find uh, something out, uh, having been a consumer of that sort of thing before, um, was really exciting, and so then, uh, and then Chris came up with some other DVD extra ideas, and we did those. But I, I, I'm very fond of that first one. Um, so I was sort of part of the furniture with the DVDs mm. then. Um, I think it's got to be said that the 
the, the piece that made the biggest impact has got to be your your um, your stay with John Levine. The <laughs> 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 arguably greatest DVD extra of all time. Interesting. I was on a train and. Um, a bag of Haribo landed in front of me. <laughs> and I went, this bloke went, oh, they didn't have jelly babies. And I went, oh, Doctor Who fan. And he went, yeah, yeah. He said, I loved your um, Peter R. Newman documentary. And he said, uh, he said, you should do, he said, John Levine's very funny. You should do a sort of, you should do a fly on the wall documentary with John Levine. And I, and I so I was being a bit showy off really. I texted. Who did I text? I think I texted Chris Chapman and said, we should do a, I'm on a train, a bloke says we should do a fly on the wall with John Levine. And Chris went, I've got a meeting with Dan Hall next week, I'm going to pitch it. So I showed him the guy in the thing, and I went, oh, okay. And lo and behold, within about three weeks, it was on. It was supposed to be for the moon base. I pitched it for the moon base because that was John's first brush with Doctor Who, he's an uncredited signer man. Um, but then, it, but because they were reissuing Cross Access, and I don't think they got a load of extra stuff for the special edition, they decided to run it on that instead, which is fine. Um, and yeah, we went. To, I went and did. A, I went and spent the weekend with with John, who I think was he was quite savvy to what was going on. There was no, there was certainly no. Uh, I didn't want it to be that. I, I think John is a fascinating man, and he's very funny. Um, and I didn't want to be that sort of, I never liked Doctor Who fans who were sort of rude or take the piss out of the icons of Doctor Who. I remember, being, I remember the first time I spoke heard people at conventions sort of, yeah, he's a crap, he's this, that, that. I thought, well, at least you want your own still, I, I know. So there was, there was never any intention to sort of point and laugh at John. The intention was to, sh to show him with all his glorious eccentricity to the fore and maybe I was there to sort of bring some of it out and occasionally challenge some of his, and I'm not saying anything I wouldn't say to him, some of his flights of fancy <laughs> and maybe some of his, some of his, because sometimes, as Terence Dick says, we listen to John Ravine and he thinks the show is called Sergeant Benton that also starred John Pertwee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and to try and, and because, uh, because John only ever, he didn't like to do commentaries with other people, and he likes to be on the stage on his own to the whole court because he's a, a, a performer and entertainer. I thought it would, and, and because we get on, I thought he would allow me to sort of challenge some of those things that don't normally get challenged because of the way that he tends to be a one-man band, if you like, and just to see what that sort of friction brings, of sort of go, oh, no, that's not quite right, is it? And see if that brought out a different side to it. And I think it did, which is why when we had that sort of chat at the end by the the river, he sort of said, actually, uh, yeah, I mean, he sort of reined it in a little bit, and I thought he got quite an honest picture of a man who is, clearly loves stuff to do, um, and is a, clearly a, uh, a man of contradictions, but I think he really, I think he's, the subject deserved the time, because he's, because he is quite an interesting guy, don't you? Have you had feedback for him since the release, who you've often seen it? Yeah, well, I first, I, th I think John went through a period of not liking it because somebody said, "Oh, John said that the, the editor wasn't very kind to him." No, he first he mm -hmm. rang me up and said he loved it, and then I think somebody had said to him at convention, "Well, they're taking the Mickey out of you," and, he, and John, being John, went, "Yeah, well, they probably were. I'm, I'm furious about it." <laughs> and then, and then he watched it again and rang me in tears. But I think it's marvelous. So I think I, I, I think at the moment he loves it. <laughs> <laughs> like, who, who knows? I'm going to confess when I watched it. I was relieved to see his mother appear because I was starting to suspect she was she was up in the attic. Yes, bless him. Uh, so the, the last thing I'll ask before we go to the else, um, has he ever invited you back for another round of golf? Well, do you know what? There's an, uh, there's not enough of that in the thing. I think John takes golf very seriously, and um, and you look, we all know John. He is he is. Um, out there and positive, but he also then sometimes gets furious at that stuff. And, and I heard him saying to Chris, like, he said, he's not using my golf clubs. And Chris was like, no, that's the game. I said, you're going to make him look like an idiot because if he can't play golf, he's, got to look, he's just going to look stupid. And I was like, no, I don't mind looking stupid. That's fine. If I look stupid, I don't care. That's fine. That's what I'm here for. Um, it's not really about me anyway. And I don't care if I'm 
bad at golf. Um, and then of course, I had to bring it. I did a swing, and it went, and he, and he, and he was that, and, and, and it went far, and it did well, and he, he was sort of like, oh, you're lucky, and I was like, yeah, I am. That, that's fine. And then I hit it again, and I had a lot of luck. I only <laughs> actually screwed up the very last two shots. Otherwise, it would have been I would have won. Uh, and tell John wasn't. John wasn't really. He was sort of going, oh, you're lucky, but deep down he was really angry <laughs> because he wants to be really. He's, I think he, he takes his golf seriously and enjoys his golf. And the fact that I couldn't care less <laughs> was doing quite well. <laughs> really annoying. Uh, and he was. He was really annoying because he wouldn't shut up about it afterwards. Uh, uh, so I don't think he will invite me back to play golf. Uh, but he, he, he's invited me for tea. He sometimes phones me up um, just just to chat to this job. So that's nice. I'm pleased, to, therefore, that he yeah he feels that it wasn't uh, it was you know it was meant to be an amusing documentary, but it wasn't never intended to be a stitch up. And I think that's exactly how it came across. Good. Good. Can I ask you about a relatively new project you're working on, um, for Phantom Films? The, uh, yes. The uh, who talk? Who talk? Yeah. What's the idea behind this this project? Well, it was something I wanted to do for the BBC and we hadn't talked about it was to fill the gaps with the commentaries um, but what happened was when an enemy came out and um, both would have benefited I think from a, an extensive extras package both of them deserved that but um, nobody at the BBC gave the monkeys uh, and so they came out with nothing on, which I thought was a huge missed opportunity. And we could have done it for them. And we, we in fact, I had four pieces of, you know, sourced feedback and spoken to Gareth Gwen. And it, it, it was, there was interest there. As always, with Doctor Who, driven by the fans who are professional people, um, uh, with the BBC never quite knowing exactly what how lucky they are or the resource they've got. Um, but I think they thought these are going to sell anyway. Get them out there and these will sell without any extras on, and extras cost money. Boom. So, Paul and Dexter at Phantom said, um, why, don't, why don't we provide a commentary as, you know, as, a, as a sort of separate thing so that people can play it? Like, Brilliant. And uh, so, we did an enemy and web. Um, they're a bit more hastily convened, and we can't quite get as many people necessarily on. So, so quite often, it's you know one person on one or two episodes rather than. than five people having a conversation across six episodes just because of the practicality of it. So, that, so some of them more one-on-ones, although some of the ones we've done more recently have more people. We're learning as we go. It's very fraught, tight schedules. Uh, and so once Enemy and uh, Web have gone well, I, we sort of went back to that thing, so why don't we try and, anyone that hasn't got a commentary, let's get, let's get a commentary. And then because of various practicalities, we started going, well, we've got so-and-so, there is a commentary for that episode, but so-and-so is not on it, so why don't we get so-and-so as a bonus, and, and it sort of gradually evolved that, and sometimes it was to do with personnel, you know, somebody couldn't make it on the day, so suddenly they go, well, we've got him, we've got him, and they were both involved in that episode, off you go, Toby, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, and then they, they just looked at ones that they, as punters, um, had maybe not thought the commentary have got enough people on or, or it was the early days of the commentaries where I think if you look at something like Invasion of Time it's got the same four people on all six episodes one of whom is Matt Irving who didn't actually work on the Invasion of Time and when you look at that you go and then when but when John Kelly who I think did so much for the commentary range when he really got his fingers into the commentaries if, he, if he'd done that two years later, um, he'd have had me moderating it, and we'd have had Milton Johns and Chris Trenchell and Lee Derek Dimmer, and we'd have mixed it up, some people on one episode, some people on another, so there'd be a sort of revolving door just to keep it interesting and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and so some of the early commentaries, I think, suffered not from, because it was a new, fairly new medium, you know, from having the same people on all the way through. So just to clarify for all that's maybe not familiar with this, this project, we're not talking about DVDs here, are we? No, what it is, they come out on CD. So you watch the episodes on your DVD player, and you put the thing in your CD, and you key them up together, and it's like a DVD commentary, but it's just on a different disc. Um, and we watch the episodes and talk along 
you know, they are they are done to the episodes, as it were. And so you've done Web of Fear, Web of Fear, Enemy of the World, most of the I don't know, most of the orphaned Park on Track episodes. Um, uh, Remembrance of the Daleks, the Demons, uh, and a few more that I think I have to be quiet about. <laughs> so we're doing some more in a couple of weeks. Um, actually, that should be quite valuable because I did check the next one called beforehand. Oh, you okay. can mention any of the titles that are up and coming. Oh, out. okay. Well, uh, we've done pretty much all of the all of the Hartman Trend Orphan episodes, and some we've done twice. Um, because, again, practicality, some people weren't available on the day, so we've just done them twice, which is fine. Um, uh, and <laughs> also, so what else are we up? We've, we're halfway through recording. We've done a couple of episodes of City of Death, we're doing a couple more. Uh, uh, oh, and we filled in the gaps uh, of Unearthly Child, because that only had episode one and four done. So we've done, we've done all four, actually. Um, and uh, uh, is that it? I think that sounds yeah. like enough. Yeah, that's a, but there's more planned as well. We do loads in a day because it's a, obviously a tighter budget than the BBC. So, whereas I used to get exhausted doing four or five episodes in a day, I think I did about nine last time. But was, <laughs> what else would I be doing? Well, you may have noticed that we've come to a, to an end. Uh, Steve has <laughs> just very subtly indicated. Um, I'd just like to say, not only are you a great interviewer, but you're a great interviewer. Oh, um, bless you. Someone who could chat away. And thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so Hooverville is now over. I'm sat in the car, ready for my drive home. I've been unable to partake in the individual podcast interviews at the end of the day, which is absolutely gutting because I wanted to suggest to Nick and Eric Sayward that they get together to do a very nice visitation story. But that's fine. That thing can stay on my hard drive for as long as it needs to. But I'm sure that Justice of the Terraleptils will one day be available to us all. Or should it be Judgment? Judgment of the Terrell Deals, I'll leave that with you. I'll update you all at some point and it'll all be fine. I got to meet Janet, I got to meet Sophie, I got to meet, well, a host of brilliant people today. And not just the guests. There were some very chatty, very, very nice people at the convention. And I for one am glad I went. I even got to see my old mate Chris from the Pharaohs Project. Yes, we sat next to each other for three years at university. And even after all this time, we can still chat like we saw each other yesterday. So until next time, when you'll probably get some interviews, or even some nice reviews of Big Finish, be seeing you. That was the Doctor Who Tin Dog Podcast, available on iTunes, YouTube, Twitter, RSS, Vimeo, and across the internet. Doctor Who and its associated properties are all copyright and trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Why not become a supporter by visiting patreon.com slash tin dog. Contact the show on tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. <laughs>